In this video, we're going to be looking at binomial distributions as a part of the probability distribution standard. So let's start by taking a look at our learning objectives for today. The first thing we're going to learn about is the distribution setup. What this means is we're going to figure out what a binomial distribution actually is. Then we're going to look at how to solve the kinds of questions we get on exams that involve binomial distributions. After that, we're going to take a quick look at inverse binomial problems. And finally, look at some situational discussion, which really means how we talk about binomial distributions in the context of particular questions. So let's get started with the distribution setup. Binomial distribution is a probability distribution that comes from counting the number of successes in a fixed set of trials. It gives us the probability of a certain number of successes occurring in those trials. An example of how this works is we could use a binomial distribution to find the probability of rolling five ones out of 10 dice rolls. Here, there would be 10 trials because each trial is a dice roll and a success would be rolling a one. The distribution would find us the probability of getting those five successes. Another thing about binomial distributions is they're discrete. We remember from our basic probability concepts that when a variable is discrete, it means that it can only take on whole number values. So the number of successes that occur in a binomial distribution have to be whole numbers. There are some really important conditions on when we're actually allowed to use a binomial distribution. We can remember those conditions by using the acronym PITT, P-I-T-T. P stands for the fact that the probability of success is fixed. So what that means is that in a binomial distribution, the probability of a trial being successful has to be the same for every single trial. I stands for independence of trials. What that means is that the result of one trial has to be completely independent from all the other results of trials. T stands for two possible outcomes of trials. This means that for every single trial, there can only be two possible outcomes. And the last T stands for the fact that trial number is fixed. So what that means is that there has to be a certain specific number of trials that we do in the situation that we're given. It can't just keep going on forever. It's really important to be familiar with all of these conditions in order to get those higher marks on our exams. They come up in almost every kind of binomial question we get. So now we're familiar with the conditions, let's move on to how to actually solve some questions. The binomial problems we get in exams usually involve calculating a probability using a distribution. This is going to be the probability of getting a certain number of successes in a certain number of trials. So remember, the thing we're looking for is the probability. We can get our graphic calculator to do most of the work for us, but we're going to need to know some parameters in each problem that we can put into our calculator. So let's look at the parameters that we need. The first parameter is called x. x represents the number of successful trials. The second parameter is called numtrial. It makes sense that that stands for the total number of trials that we do. And the last parameter is just called p. p stands for the probability of success. Remember that one of the conditions was that the probability of getting a successful trial was fixed for every single trial. The names x, numtrial, and p should be exactly what you see on your calculator, so you know where to type everything in. There's another thing we have to choose. For each problem we do with binomial distribution, we have to pick the bpd or the bcd mode. These different options have to do with the number of successful trials that we're told in the question that we're doing. If the question gives an exact number, that means we need to use the BPD mode. If we were asked to find the probability of getting exactly 10 heads in 15 coin flips, we would use BPD. Remember that X, the parameter we put in our calculator, is the number of successful trials. So when we use BPD, we just put in X as the exact number of successes that we're looking for. However, when we get a group of numbers, we use BCD mode. When we say a group of numbers, that means not just exactly one number, but a whole different set. So the keywords we'd look for to know to use BCD are things like more than, less than, at least, up to, or between. When we use BCD, we still enter the parameter X. Here, it means the number of successes is less than or equal to X. So say we put in 3 for x, that's going to give us the probability of getting less than or equal to 3 successes. We can match up those keywords we just looked at with what values we should put in for x. So if we were asked in the question for up to 4 successes, we would put x equals 4, because that's the probability of being up to 4, but no further. If the question asked us for less than 4, then we would put x equals 3, not 4. That's because this is a discrete distribution, so if x is less than 4, it's got to be less than or equal to 3. Now, we know that all probabilities add to 1, so if we were asked for more than 4, then we could do 1 minus the probability of less than or equal to 4. 
Similarly, if we were asked for at least 4, then we could do 1 minus the probability of x being less than or equal to 3. And for x being between 2 and 4, we could do the probability of less than or equal to 4 minus the probability of less than or equal to 1, because that would leave us with just the probability of being 2, 3, and 4. It's quite common to get problems in exams that ask us to use BCD, so it's really useful to be familiar with these different ways in which we can enter x so we get these different keywords. So once we've picked all our parameters and chosen between BPD and BCD, we've got some actual solving to do. Everyone's calculator is a bit different, but a lot of them use a similar setup to the following. The first step is to go to Menu and select Stat. We select the Dist option, which stands for Distribution. Then we select BINM, which stands for binomial. At that point, we've got to pick BPD or BCD, depending on which one fits the situation, like we just discussed. And finally, we enter our parameters, x, num, trial, and p, and get the calculator to solve for the probability. So for each question, the first thing to do is to work out what x, num, trial, and p actually are. Then we figure out if it's BPD or BCD, and what to type in for our x value to get the probability we want. And then we can go for it. So let's try an example to make sure that all of that makes sense. Let's say that Josh picks out five apples from a bag. Each apple is either red or green, and the probability of picking a red apple is 0.4. What's the probability that he picks exactly two red apples? The first thing to note is the keyword exactly. We know that when the question says exactly, that means we're going to use BPD. Next we get the parameters. Josh picked out five apples, so the number of trials is going to be five. The probability of picking a red apple was 0.4, so the probability of success is 0.4. And we want the probability of him getting two red apples, so the number of successes is going to be 2. We can put all of that into our calculator, and we get that the probability of him picking exactly two red apples is 0.3456. Let's try another example. Vivian marks 20 exam papers one day. The chance of a student failing the exam is 0.25. What's the chance that more than six students fail the exam? So the first thing to notice in this question are the keywords more than. That tells us straight away to use BCD. Then for the parameters, Vivian marked 20 exam papers, so the number of trials is going to be 20. The chance of a student failing was 0.25, so the probability in each trial of failing is 0.25. Lastly, we want to know the chance that more than six students fail the exam. We can remember back to our chart that showed us how to use the keywords. We can see that for the keyword more than 4, we're going to do 1 minus the probability of less than or equal to 4. We know that putting in x as a number means less than or equal to. So here, we're going to put x equals 6, because that'll give us the chance of it being less than or equal to 6. Using BCD and all those parameters, we get that the probability of being less than or equal to 6 is 0.7858. So now, using that keyword chart, we want more than 6, so we do 1 minus the probability of less than or equal to 6, which gives us 0.2142. Both those examples that we just solved are exactly the type of question we would get on the exam, so it would be a good idea to make sure that you really understand how we did both of those two examples. Now let's move on to inverse binomial problems. Sometimes, instead of finding a probability, we actually need to find one of the parameters. We might need to find the number of trials, or maybe the probability of a success. To do this, we're going to use the binomial formula. But before we look into that, we've got to note that to do inverse problems, we've got to have the probability of x equaling 0. Or in other words, we need to know the probability of no successes. This is the binomial formula. It looks pretty complicated and pretty hard to solve. But if we make x equal to 0, then suddenly this is what the binomial formula looks like which is a lot easier to solve. So the way we do these is we substitute in the probability of x being 0, and then we can solve for whatever we're looking for. So let's look at actually doing an inverse problem by solving the simplified equation that we just saw. Say there are 12 students in a class. The probability of no students in that class having bikes is 0.0138. What's the probability that any given student has a bike? The simplified formula that we just looked at was that the probability of x being 0 is 1 minus p to the power of n. Into that formula, we can put the number of students in the class, 12, which will be n, and the probability of no students having bikes, which we were told is 0.0138. That gives us that 0.0138 equals 1 minus p to the power of 12. 
If we solve this equation, we'll get p, the probability of a student having a bike. The opposite of the power of 12 is the power of 1 12th. So let's put both sides of the equation to the power of 1 12th. That gives us that 1 minus p equals 0.0138 to the power of 1 12th. On our calculator, that tells us that 1 minus p equals 0.7. So we can find that p equals 0.3. The probability of any given student having a bike is 0.3. Inverse binomial problems don't really come up much at all. There's only been one in a single exam in the past couple years. It's good to be familiar with how to do them in case they do come up, but don't worry too much. Let's move on to our last point, the situational discussion. Sometimes we might need to justify why a binomial distribution fits the question or situation we've been given. The way we do this is we take a look at the situation and see how it matches the pit conditions that we looked at before. We also might need to justify why the distribution doesn't fit the question. Again, we look at the situation and see how it doesn't match the pit conditions. The most useful thing here is the fact that justifying questions or discussion questions always involve the distribution conditions. So let's do an example. The same situation as before. Josh picks out five apples from a bag. Each apple is either red or green, and the probability of picking a red apple is 0.4. How does the situation fit a binomial distribution, and how not? First, P stands for the fixed probability of success. We were told that the probability of getting a red apple is 0.4, so that's fixed, which means it fits the distribution. The next condition is I, independence. All the different colors of the apples might not be independent. We don't really know. Sometimes apples all ripen together at the same time, so they might all change color together. So that might not fit the condition of independence. T stands for two possible outcomes. The two outcomes here are red or green, so that fits. And the last T stands for a fixed number of trials. There's a fixed number of apples. We know that Josh picked five, so that fits the situation. Three out of four conditions fit, and the fourth one may or may not. So this is a pretty good distribution for the situation. Now we've covered all the learning objectives, so let's take a quick look at what you need to know from this video. First, we looked at distribution setup. We know that binomial distribution is discrete and counts the number of successful trials, giving a probability of that number. We also know that the conditions for binomial distributions are given by the acronym PIT. For solving questions, we know that we need a certain number of parameters to put in the calculator, and we've got to decide between BPD and BCD. For inverse binomial problems, we use the formula, but we can only do it if we've got the probability of x being zero, because otherwise the formula is really complicated and hard to solve. And for the situational discussion, we've got to match all the different bits of the situation to the pit conditions. For a binomial question in the exam, you should be able to describe the distribution and any of the concepts we covered, solve the questions using your calculator and or the formula, and justify why the binomial distribution fits the situation. If you can do all those things, you're well on your way to getting those merit and excellence grades for any binomial questions that come up. In the next video, we'll be moving on to looking at the Poisson distribution. Cheers, and have a good one.